Tell me your name and um, you know what you're doing in terms of your 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 research and uh, how it relates to to Colorado's cannabis sector. My name is Leah Berman. I'm at the University of South Florida in the Applied Anthropology program, and I study cannabis and economics. So, what unique um, uh, you know approaches or what unique contributions do you think you can bring as an anthropologist to the study of cannabis in Colorado? So, anthropology is the study of humans, past and present, is kind of the um, standard definition. But what anthropologists can bring to it is that since we're a holistic social science, that means that we can. Um, bridge kind of gaps between the disciplines. So what's unique about anthropology with the cannabis industry is exactly kind of what I explained before is that, you know, people say that they're going to do something, but they actually end up doing things very different. And this comes from our founding father, Malinowski, who said, don't listen to what people do, listen, but then watch what they actually do. And so I think that's instead of looking at a bunch of statistics that can tell you a lot about the industry, I think it's also important for social scientists to use the ethnographic method, uh, meaning being a participant observer, observing in, a, in an environment that you're studying. I think that um, those methodologies will really help and aid um, the statistical data that we do have. And, and I think that that's what anthropology can bring, how people interact with this substance, how people um, make analyses in their head about what they're going to do with it or how they're going to buy it or what they're going to use it for. Briefly explain what you did in Colorado as a bud tender and then one or two of the, the most compelling things you found so far. The majority of my time in the industry I spent uh, being a bud tender or a canisseur as people call them. And what this job entails is um, selling product to people coming into the shop. I worked in a medical only dispensary, which I think is um, a big distinction to make. And uh, so what I found from my preliminary research is that the workers in the industry are getting paid very low wages. Um, They're getting about $9.50 an hour or up to $10.50 an hour. And that's really not enough to um, live in a comfortable way in Colorado. So I realized that the day I got my first paycheck, it was about for $1,500 for 40 hours a week for a whole month. And I, my first thought was like, hmm, all right, I'm in trouble here. And my second thought was looking around, you know, if I'm in trouble, what is that, what the heck is everyone else doing then? How, how are they living by themselves and, and living on this income? Because I just couldn't figure out how, how that would work. And so I think that's when I started really talking to people and asking people, you know, what do you feel about this? How are you making a living? How are you doing this? And it, it was very quite obvious that they, uh, a lot of the employees buy um, – cheap medical products because, of course, the medical marijuana is much uh, less expensive than recreational marijuana, and they sell the marijuana through informal markets as a side job to make extra cash to bridge the gap. And so do you feel that that's um, uh, um, just something you saw in one facility, or do you think you can kind of give an approximation that maybe across the state this is happening on a wide scale? I can't say definitively that this is happening on a wide scale, but I would assume that this is what's happening for a couple of reasons. One, 
um, employees know a lot about the systems that work. So the computer systems that regulate the marijuana can be easily manipulated, but only easily manipulated by people who know the system. Can you elaborate? Like, what do you mean? How, what would be an example of the manipulating the system? Sure. So for example, um, one of the, one of these integral parts of our system called the plant count loophole, what I call it, is very integral to buying large amounts of product uh, in short periods of time. And P, so this a, a plant count is something that you get when you get a license. So when I go to a doctor and I say, um, I would like to grow marijuana at home, but s- the legal six um, six plants aren't enough for me because I make topicals, the state can say, all right, well, I'm going to give you a license to grow 24 plants or 46 plants or however many plants. Now, having however many plants you have, that also translates into how much money you can buy in a shop. So if I have the legal right to grow 24 plants, for example, I can I can buy more than the standard two ounces a day. So that means that people with high plant counts can come in every single day and buy, let's say, a half a pound of marijuana every day for 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 years. Mm -hmm. So this so and, and in order to get these high plant counts, you kind of have to be in these social systems to know which doctors to go to, to know what to say, to get these extended plant counts and so on. And so a lot of people who work in the industry or are straight up informal market sellers know have the highest plant counts and also they use high plant counts as cultural capital so they can come in and say i have a 75 plant count i'm very important as a customer to you and so also the dispensaries like high plant counts because if these customers sign over their plants meaning i can now grow your marijuana for you the dispensaries can increase their production so there's there's this um, uh, relationship between high plan counts customers and the dispensaries that want them. So this this brings into how you can obtain a lot of marijuana very quickly, day after day after day. And so since you have to be in these social systems, it makes sense that the people who are sending products out of state lines in large quantities are also the people who have access to large quantities. Now, they can get a lot of these have loopholes because when you enter the people's plant counts into your system, the bud tenders use two medical systems, Metric and um, MJ Freeway. And Metric goes straight to the state. And so that um, houses however many plant uh, plants you're allowed to grow. Now, that's up to the bud tender to enter in to the system. So let's say you're a customer and you come in and you've previously had a 99 plant count, but your, your uh, medical license has just expired. And you didn't get a doctor that gave you that 99 plant count for your new license. Well, I, as a bud tender, can kind of be in cahoots with you and um, not update that information through the systems. Mm. Therefore, I can still be selling you those quantities of marijuana day after day, really without the state knowing. Could you uh, maybe give us... Um, you know, what you imagine one or two of the take home messages of your anthropological work in the cannabis sector might be? One is, I think, to regulate the system. We need a better, we need stricter regulation systems to regulate the product. Um, another one is to, um, I think that we need to have a discussion about the bifurcation between um, medical marijuana and recreational marijuana. I feel like that bifurcation or that uh, the, the difference in standards of both of those are cause a lot of issues, a lot of structural issues. And then I think that the medical community needs to decide how um, for, for vulnerable populations what's going to be a kind of standardized um, uh, guidelines to administer uh, cannabis to, to different kinds of populations. So that's where I see things coming in. But I think that a lot of these depend on whether neighboring states and other states 
are going to start legalizing things recreationally. And I think it's very exciting to see how they're going to do that um, structurally because California, um, Washington, and Colorado have all chosen different systems. And, and now we're just seeing the consequences of those systems. You know, what is the difference, at least in Colorado, with medical and recreational marijuana in terms of actual um, places of work or, or places where you can go and buy weed? Just so people who are maybe tuning in for the first time learning about cannabis, what, how do you distinguish or what are the characteristics that are different between these two? So medical and recreational marijuana are actually split from the time the seed hits the soil. So um, as a, let's say I'm a growing facility, I have two sides to my grow house. I have a recreational side and I have a medical side of growing cannabis. Now, the plants are in no way different from each other. I can grow the same strain on both sides, seed to harvest. Nothing's different about the product. Uh, what, what, Dif what becomes differential is when that product is harvested and then packaged. So, um, it, so each plant is tracked with a tag. So when it's grown, it's tracked with a tag that will either say medical or recreational. Once I harvest those products, I, ha I have to sell them in a certain dosage. So medical side can have a higher dosage than the recreational side. That's one difference. And it's also taxed differently. And that's, that's how the system, that's why taxpayers really like the system because you're, the state is making a large uh, proportion of proceeds from the taxes from um, recreational marijuana. Now, the medical side, since it's considered um, a medical uh, product, it's not as taxed as high and you can buy larger doses of it um, at one time. So when you so as a customer, you can either choose to go to a medical only dispensary. That means only people with medical license to buy um, higher dose products, or you can choose to go to a split medical recreational facility that sells both, but on different sides of a building, for example, or different sides of a large room that sells it. When you talked about the workers and some individuals, you know, buy some weed in order to augment their wages, what one or two things could you suggest in terms of worker protections to ensure workers are, you know, whatever, fairly treated or there's dignity in the workplace? Like, has anything come onto your radar about that particular issue of worker protections? Yeah, so a major issue also with workers is that they don't have any health or benefits, and it's a cash-only system. So a lot of what I hear is that um, uh, a lot of workers can't claim their income because it's cash-only and there's no um, uh, receipts and um, things that they need, for example, to get a loan for a house. So uh, I think that a lot of the issues that the worker have are actually larger issues of the industry. So getting banking, right, getting proper banking structures, um, that's going to be a huge one. Obviously, I think with any kind of workers' rights, it's about collective action and education um, as a way of social change. So also educating um, workers on the ground of their rights currently and um, looking to kind of mobilize for, for health and benefits, I think, is a really good place to start. Also, just supporting um, large-scale state and federal change to changes in the minimum wage, which we've been seeing um, uh, as a big push through many politicians to um, increase the minimum wage would also help cannabis workers uh, and also all workers who are working with low wages. So um, in many ways, the plight of the of the bar the bud tender is also the plight of other low wage um, I mean low wage inequality workers. Do you enjoy doing the work you do as an anthropologist in the cannabis sector? If so, what do you enjoy about it? I am so overjoyed <laughs> to be studying the marijuana industry and and looking at how people interact with cannabis. Um, on many different levels. Uh, I, I was saying, you know, I originally had a different topic for my PhD, and I was so lucky to have um, had the experiences that I did when I did to be able to further this for, um, for my PhD topic. I wake up every day very excited about 
uh, reading new new literature, lo- talking to people in the industry, speaking to other professionals. Anything we didn't cover or any last words you want to kind of share as we just kind of wrap this up? Currently in Colorado, there's 18,000 badged or state certified bud tenders operating in Colorado. Uh, I think that though the creation of these jobs is really great, I think we need to talk about who the who's employing these jobs um, and 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 the quality uh, of the wages of these jobs and where the wealth is being held within the industry. So this will help create. Um, a more transparent industry that's that'll be better for the state and for workers and will allow the industry to continue to grow. So um, just looking at kind of where those jobs are created in the economy and what the wages are of those new incoming jobs uh, should be looked at by not just me, but sociologists and other social um, scientists in the future. And I'm looking forward to seeing that data. I really appreciate those um the points you just made. And Leah, thanks so much for um, joining me on this interview and um, look forward to hearing more about your work. Okay. And you have a great day. Thank you so much. Meet Jeffrey. Jeffrey is 35 and is a trimmer in a cannabis grow facility in Denver. It's been five years since the recreational use of cannabis has been legal in the state. In 2015, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment included marijuana as one of the state's 10 winnable battles with environmental priorities that have known and effective solutions to prevent negative environmental health outcomes. These environmental priorities include planning strategies at the growing and trimming level to minimize the interference of environmental hazards into cannabis products, which may potentially harm cannabis consumers. When Jeffrey goes to work, he enters an incubated facility where cannabis grow rooms are separate from sterilized trim rooms to keep environmental contaminants such as pesticides and powdery mildew separate and isolated. Jeffrey is the last individual working in close contact with the cannabis products. He must change into clean and sterile work clothes at the designated changing area and can only enter the trim room with clean rubber gloves and a lab coat, which are provided by the facility. Once in the trim room, Jeffrey's coworkers who are seated in the designated trimming stations welcome him. There must be 12 feet of spacing between each trimming station to promote better ventilation and air quality. Sitting in close and tight spaces with minimal airflow can increase the concentration of contaminants and potentially interfere with the cannabis product working at hand. Each trim station includes clean sets of rubber gloves, isopropyl alcohol for disinfecting equipment, and multiple pairs of clean trimming scissors, which are alternated every time a new cannabis strain is being trimmed. The facility runs an extractor ventilating system that promotes indoor air quality by lessening humidity and decreasing the risk of disease to cannabis crops. The ventilating system also runs through the trim rooms to promote airflow. Cleaning and disinfecting household products must be stored and sealed to prevent fumes from entering aerosol droplets that could potentially enter the cannabis flowers. Hazardous contaminants such as lead, radon, and asbestos may come from the facility's infrastructure through the ventilating systems. Inline filter boxes are required in rooms to protect the flowers and the workers. Jeffrey and the trimming team follow these environmental priorities established by the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment to minimize the interference of environmental hazards into cannabis products to ensure clean production. My last job as a bud tender, we had really great clients, lots of regulars, and being able to communicate just an easy flow conversation, like how's your day? But when you come with an attitude and you know, I understand your day's like bad, you're buying weed. Did you forget that it was illegal and you had to go on the streets to try to find it? And the fact that we have all this variety behind us and you come with an attitude and you're really upset and you're very picky about your, your weed or you make comments of like, oh, the other dispensary was better. Well, go to the other dispensary. You know, you don't have to be here. I don't have to be here. 
The fact that all of this is possible, I think everyone should go into dispensary with a good attitude. Yeah. My name is B. I worked at a bud tender in Colorado for about three years. As a bud tender, usually we just ring up weed and are very knowledgeable about it and we give advice. When you're first starting at a dispensary, they usually have different strains. So being knowledgeable about the strains that they have, the genetics, the type of uh, effects they have on different people. So you have your regulars. They come in every day. They know what they want. Um, it, you try to give them like different ideas of like new strains or whatnot, and then you have like your newbies. You've never been dispensaries before, and they're like all excited about the weed and all the mass amount of it. Um, and then you have the other guys, uh, like when you go to restaurants or a foodie, you have like a person who comes in just checking out different dispensaries, different strains. Um, if you're a stoner, sometimes your tolerance level is a little different when you keep going to the same dispensary, so you have to venture out to different ones. It's a huge industry and the best way to sell it is to give out samples. So people will come in and be like, hey, I got this new product, you know, you guys want you to sell it? And we're like, oh, what is it? You know, we haven't tried it. We're not gonna sell it if we haven't tried it. And we would take it and it's a lot easier to connect with the clients when you actually have had it. When it's a person who's their first time, it's real exciting. You tell them all the types of products and what they do. Uh, if it's a health issue, depending on what it is, like cramps or depression, you know, we pick different strains to help with that situation. And there was this really old lady who I probably wouldn't have expected to be a smoker. And I just really loved her energy, if that's too cliche, because she told me her story about smoking. She had cancer and then, you know, people suggested that she smoked. And she was just so full of life and she seemed really, really happy. And she talked about, you know, the differences that she went through with her cancer and with smoking and how she's happy to be alive today, how she's continued to smoke. So the fact that we changed her life just made me like really like her a lot. I do try to add on different things to their purchase, whether it's edibles, concentrates, and there's always something that's going to expire and we have to get rid of it, or I have to get rid of it. So someone comes for, uh, I don't know, like five grams, you try to make them get like half an ounce. Oh, this is on sale, it's really dank, and you know, it does this, this, and this, and it just came in. So just kind of upselling in a sense, or adding on an edible to their purchase. If it's a certain day, we have certain discounts. So two for Tuesdays, two pre-rolls for the price of the one. When I meet people, they ask what I do, and I say I'm a butt tender, and they automatically have the stereotype that I'm a stoner. Yeah, I smoke a lot, I have to know my strains, but I'm a very knowledgeable person. I probably know more about weed than your average person. It's part of my job. The people who own the company, including the managers, they were all men, late 20s, early 30s. Um, they kind of were millionaires, or they came from money and they were all friends, which is why they got promoted very easily. They would be in a sense like, oh, you're a bud tender. Well, I was a bud tender at once and I got promoted to management in like six months and now I'm opening this store up with you guys. So in a sense, they were trying to make it seem as though we would be in that position, but we never, we never were given that opportunity. And the other one was like daddy's money type bro dude who, you know, they know it's a market, so they had their family kind of bring in the money, they did their warehouse, they did the store, and I mean, they grew amazing weed, but they, uh, they had an advantage. So it's like the, the dudes who wear like the beards and the plaid shirts, and they're like lumbrosexual, Colorado native, you know, it's a type of genre. And as for men, it was the same for females, it was very clicky and stuff. So my first job, that I had, my manager told me that if they hired an ugly girl, that the manager would be fired. The fact that I have a degree and I have retail experience and I have sales experience, on my resume, which I gave them, kind of hurt my feelings because we realized all the women at our job are very attractive, but it helps sell weed because majority of the clients are male-based, so the fact that they can come in and, you know, they see a girl selling weed, you know, they're happy, I guess they want to hit on us or whatever, but also for women. Women kind of get very uncomfortable, uh, I guess, in certain situations, especially since weed used to be illegal. 
when you imagine dispensary, you're probably thinking drug dealers behind the counter trying to sell you weed. So the fact that they can come and they see women like us alike and they can kind of relate and we could discuss things that you probably wouldn't be able to discuss with other people. When I first got hired, uh, I had benefits. Um, I had full benefits actually, medical, vision, dental. Um, they even had it where if we got injured on the job, they would help us. Uh, my second dispensary, we did not receive any benefits. I believe bud tenders should get an hourly wage and at least one to two percent of the sales goes for compensation if they don't receive bonuses or tips. I feel like the only thing that really affected my job is the customers and the stress of it because it's constantly changing and you get a little stressed out. <laughs> um, but with people coming in, there's always jobs. They have warehouses and that's the other department of the industry. In the warehouses, it's a little harsher conditions, and I don't think I can handle that. But being a butt tender, you know, you have a crew that you get to talk to. Um, you're with weed all day. You get to see different strains. We have computers in front of us, so usually we're playing on the computer. Um, the fact that we can do hour breaks and run around town and do whatever. Um, I like the freedom. You come in and we give you like good buds. You have a great conversation. We make sure that if you're in a rush, we get you in and out the door. Um, if you're looking for a product and we usually don't have it, we'll save it for you, like in the back. So just a lot of customer service, we'll get tipped $10. And sometimes I'll walk home with 20 or 30 bucks, but it wasn't like you have to tip the butt tenders ever. You never really have to, but it's nice because we are picking out different buds for you and we are giving you advice and whatnot. So sometimes I have patients come in and they always come in with the wrong change. You never know someone's situation so sometimes I help them out but in the end it's my drawer. I gotta pay for that you know if it's short. So when it happens every day you know I'm gonna say something. I had a patient come in and he always comes in short and he was short five cents and I made him go back to his car to get his five cents and he came in the next day to tell the girls that, you know, that black girl's me and they're like, oh, she's from Baltimore. He's like, oh, that's why. <laughs> so I just let people know, like, even though you come into dispensary acting in a certain type of way, it's not going to get by me, you know, my attitude still will come out and this is my job. and. Forget customer service, but I'm still a human being and you will treat me like one. Chill, relax, and learn a lesson. No nine millimeters, no heat.